First question, how many of you have already downloaded the tools and installed them on your laptops? Right on. <laughs> Gives me chills. <laughs> um, so I'm Charlie Kindle, and I am the partner group program manager for the Windows Phone app platform and developer experience. Got it right. <laughs> I'm extremely excited to be here today um, to give you this uh, survey overview of the app platform uh, for Windows Phone. And uh, the general idea is for me to give you the 100 level overview of the platform um, so that as you go to the rest of the sessions in the track, uh, you'll have you know, enough context um, and you can connect the dots. Throughout the presentation, I'll try and kind of point at the other sessions that you should go to for deeper uh, dives into each of the sections. The reality is, is because we brought so much to bear um, as part of this experience with uh, Silverlight, XNA, Visual Studio, C Sharp, XNA Game Studio, Expression Blend, .NET Platform, all of these things to bear, there's a huge amount of surface area. Many of you, I think, are, are already familiar with a great deal of it. That's one of the powers that we're bringing here. Uh, but what that means is that it's very difficult in a talk like this for me to go deep in any one area. So this is a survey. It's an overview. I will uh, you know, we'll dabble in some demos, but it's primarily me blabbing. Um, and I'll try and leave some time at the end for, uh, for Q&A. So off we go. And that's the wrong direction. So. Uh, by now, it should be clear from the keynote presentations, if you were uh, just at Joe Bellafori's uh, discussion from the announcement we did at uh, Mobile World Congress, um, that this really re represents a new start for phone software from Microsoft. Um, Windows Phone 7 Series really represents a new start. We have changed our game substantially from what we've done in the past, and that starts with kind of a new philosophy of how we think about building the product, how we think about who the customer is, how we take design first in, in engineering the product, uh, um, how we think about end user experiences across the phone, um, ranging from how the, the software interacts with the hardware to how it interacts with software plus service, all the way to how we enable um, a phenomenal application up and game platform for developers. So, we talk about different and a, and a fresh start. We really think that uh, what we've done is different. And we've heard from um, the people we've talked to about it, both developers over the last year and the public in general since Mobile World Congress, that um, it is different. It does come across as different. And it really starts from this idea of smart design. And um, this is one of the areas where I'm going to encourage you to go deep um, and, and really pay attention to follow on session. The session that immediately follows mine is presented by uh, the, the core design team for Windows Phone 7 series. And they present in the session that follows mine a, a, a really nice deep dive into the metro design language, which really is the UI of the phone. And as you're building the apps and games for Windows Phone 7 series, you're going to want to pay attention to that design language so you can create consistent experiences. And our, our, we hope that we're able to help you understand how to do that through that talk. The other uh, big part of, of, of but being different and what we're bringing to Windows Phone 7 series is this idea of these integrated experiences. Really, for the first time ever, we're bringing together um, these great assets from across Microsoft, whether it's Xbox Live and great Xbox gaming, to full office integration with the Office Hub, the full Zoom experience on the phone for uh, music and videos, a great picture experience, and so forth. All of those integrated experiences um, come together into, into something that is really different, and we think for good reasons. So a quick uh, uh, recap of the design language of Metro. Again, we'll spend more time about with this uh, it, uh, in the next session. Um, but you may have wondered where the term Metro came from. And again, Metro is just a code word that we use internally. Um, the term Metro comes from uh, signage at things like airports and subway stations and so forth. It turns out that humanity has been refining this art of communicating glanceable information for you know, hundreds of years at these types of, uh, of locations. And we really took inspiration from that in creating the Metro Design Language. Um, 
the integrated experiences that we talk about, I, I, you know, I, I talked about this already, but the idea that we have integrated experiences that are really people-centric, they uh, allow for uh, um, a, a phone that works great for people in their personal life as well as their business life. The, the market that we're going after are consumers who have both a pers personal life and a business life, and so the, the office hub and that integrated experience creates this great best for business um, users while uh, at the same time the phone is great for your personal life. Pictures are obviously super important and as is the Zoom experience for music and videos. Um, I will spend some more time talking about the marketplace experience, kind of the tail end of the talk for how end users uh, consume and bring applications onto their phone and how you as developers uh, can uh, deliver your applications and games to the phone and to your customers. And then we'll also spend time talking about games. Quick note about the hardware platform. We have a couple competing um, tensions, if you will, um, in thinking about hardware platform. On one side, we have our highest priority, which is delighting end users and making sure we have a great end user experience. Um, and that means there's, there's a level of consistency that's required. Um, we expect that, that one end user seeing a, a, a Windows phone in one consumer's hand should reasonably expect that if they go and they get a, a Windows phone, um, it works the same and the applications that they saw on that other phone also work. So that's one tension. There's another tension which is consumers want choice. They want flexibility. They want to know that um, they can have a personalized piece of hardware. Um, and it ranges from things like colors and, and materials, but also to things like whether or not there's a real physical keyboard or not. My wife, for example, can't stand touch screens. She has to have a, a physical keyboard for typing. I, on the other hand, love the slate style. And, and so we have that tension where you want that diversity. And then on the other end, you, you um, have the developer ecosystem. And what we hear from developers, and I think you'll agree, is that you want the largest possible target for your apps and games. And you don't want to have to take the burden of making sure your app or game, that you have to test it on every single variation of devices that, that's out there. So those three things are all tensions that work against each other. And what we've settled on is a strategy that we think meets a, you know, a great balance across all of those. And it really starts with the idea that we have a consistent set of hardware capabilities that we define, we do the heavy lifting of the driver work and more so the, the core engineering work to enable this with our partners, and then we allow a bunch of flexibility within those bounds. Um, and so we have one screen resolution that will uh, enable it launch, that's an 800 by 480 screen resolution, and we'll follow that on um, shortly after that with another screen resolution, which is the, um, the 320 by 480. Um, slightly smaller, allows for lower cost devices. Um, as the application and, and game developers, one of the things we'll require you to do is for you to make sure your, your apps work on both, but that's all you'll have to do. You won't have to do it on any other screen sizes. Um, all of the devices are capacitive touch. They have the same touch model. We're very specific about what that touch screen's like and so forth. Uh, there's a consistent processor and GPU um, available. Again, the idea is to give, give you as developers a very common target. <clears throat> so, we think about applications, and there's, you know, for the last, um, you know, three or four years, there's been a lot of discussion about what an app is, um, and there's always an app for that. Um, there's, but really, what is an app, right? Is an app that you think about as a developer um, something like a level app that where there's just pure client code that runs just on that device? Sure, there's examples of those, and we all can come up with them, but really the most interesting apps that exist are those apps that are composed of client-side code that provides a rich user experience and web services that power the app. And so as we built the app platform for Windows Phone 7 series, we have in very intentionally built it so that you can build apps that take advantage of both rich client-side capabilities and web services. And <clears throat> The, the way to think about this is you start with the idea that you have a web API. Um, in, in many cases, as part of your app, you're building your own web API you're exposing, or maybe you're, you're, you're surfacing something from a third party. Then you build generally a web page on top of that. That happens uh, not all the time, but very frequently. And then maybe you'll target the browser. Moving forward, and the way we think about the world is that really, 
Um, there's three sets of screens that are available. There's the, the PC, which we're all really used to. There's a the television via the game console and things like Media Center. And then there's the PC, I'm sorry, then there's the phone. And really what you want to do is you want to be able to target each of these three screens and the unique capabilities of each of them with your application. And of course there's other devices as well and they have unique capabilities. To illustrate the point, on the phone, it's a touch screen, it's small, I use it for glanceable information, I put it in my pocket a lot. The application needs to be optimized for that experience. It also has you know, short battery life or relatively short battery life, hopefully long. Um, and uh, in the case of the PC, generally I have a keyboard and I'm sitting two feet away from it, maybe a 10 inch screen, a lot of information. That's a different use model. I want my app or game optimized for that. And when you're sitting in front of the TV, it's an even more drastic different experience where I'm sitting back on the couch with my controller and there may be multiple people in the room at the same time. That's a very different experience. And so we think about how you build these rich experiences that run on these devices, but they're taught, they, they talk at the back end to web APIs. And I keep using the word experience. Let me tell you what I mean by experience. I think of an experience as something that's composed of the people that interact with the experience, the users of the applications and so forth. Um, the standards that allow the communication before, between the different components of the application or experience, the code that runs on the server, the code that runs on the client, and all of these things um, added together really result in experiences. And so when I talk about experiences, which is the new app, that's what I mean. So I'm going to now take the time to do a little demo. And this is a demo that's designed to illustrate uh, the power of um, the tooling as well as um, the uh, show off uh, an app we built for Mix that really highlights the idea of an experience that's composed of uh, uh, services plus um, experiences. So, here is, how many of you use this app? This is the Mix Schedule Builder app, written in Silverlight, um, and you can use it to go in and select what sessions you're gonna go to and manage your calendar. It's a rich um, client-side application that gives you, you know, nice, nice capabilities for interacting with your, um, uh, your calendar. There's also a web version of this, and I get to show you the phone version to have running within Visual Studio right here. So here I'm running uh, Visual Studio 2010. Um, if you don't know this about the dev tools we released today, if you already have Visual Studio 2010 RC installed, in this case I had Ultimate installed, and I installed that package, it acts as an add-on. So it just adds it on to Visual Studio so you have the full power of, say, Ultimate in my case, plus the phone developer tools, and that's what I'm showing here. Um, and so. I can go in and I hit F5 in the debugger and I targeted, you'll see up here on the top of the screen it says, uh, where's my mouse? It targeted Windows Phone M7 emulator as the target. Um, and I started the app and, I, and the reason I paused it here is I wanted to show you one other feature of the platform. Um, we've integrated into the, uh, the Silverlight programming model on Windows Phone a web browser control. And to build this app, we needed to have a sign-in UI. And all we were, had to do was embed the, the uh, web browser control within the app. And you'll notice that as I scroll around here, this is just the Windows Live login UI. And I'm not going to show you. Actually, I, I just realized I typed that wrong in order to do this right. Wow, look at that. The SIP just works. Oops, I spelled my name right. That's actually the live idea I used. I'm not going to tell you what my password is. And I'm going to sign in. Now, I have to do this because I have to get a token for, for accessing the, 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 the web services. Um, and hopefully this actually works. So you can see it's really a web browser control running within there. And you know, if this were a real app we had spent a bunch of time on, we would refine that and, and, and hide that as appropriate. Um, and now I can go back because we're signed in. And now it should just work. Oh, it's not going to work. Demo fail. There we go.
There we go. Excellent. So here, um, it's now syncing with the, with the web service, and it's bringing down the, the, the session information for me personally. And if it works correctly, after a couple seconds, it'll show all those. Um, and it's a, it's, an, it's a user experience that's optimized for the phone UI. It, you know, it supports flicking and touching, and it's, it's resized for that, for that environment. Um, it also supports offline, which is, which is really quite, kind of cool. Um, the developers that, that, that put this together did a really great job. So you know, the, that, the whole idea behind that demo was just to show off um, an example of, um, of a, an application that really targets multiple screens, and is really an application that's composed of a web service plus client code and multiple versions of client code, which is really the way we think about applications. Um, and during the course of it, I was able to show off a couple cool features. I was able to talk about the fact that the Visual Studio thing is an add-in, and I was also able to show off the browser control. So I cheated. Killed multiple birds with one stone. OK. We sat down to build the app platform, um, and really, to tell you the truth, we really got started on this in earnest about this time last year. Um, there was a bunch of pre-work that happened and so forth, um, but I joined the team, you know, roughly January-ish time last year, and we really ramped up and kind of changed everything it did. And the reason that we were able to accomplish so much is that we really brought all of Microsoft together to deliver this. And I'm extremely proud of that fact. And there's a bunch of people in this room and, and, and who are watching this that contributed to that, and they, they deserve a huge kudos. So our goals that we wrote down at that, that time of what we wanted to accomplish are listed here. And they're listed in relative priority order. The first is our mission and our goal is to deliver to end users thousands and thousands of really compelling applications and games. So when, when we wake up every day on the team thinking about what we're doing, we're thinking, OK, we're, we're enabling end users to have lots and lots of applications and games. We're going to get work with third parties to do that. So that leads to the second goal, which is how do we help make sure that those developers that do that can be profitable? And we think about profit both in terms of the currency of, of you know, dollars and cents, but also in the currency of learning. We know a lot of you um, are in this because you just, you just want to learn, and that's a, that drives you a lot. There's also uh, you know, a number of people in this room that like to show off and like to be the best at something, and we recognize that as well. And we tried to make access to the tools and so forth uh, uh, approachable enough so that people who aren't necessarily in it for the money can also be successful successful um, with the platform. And then the last goal is really to deliver on this vision of applications that are composed of both web services and client code. And so we explicitly set out to make that a part of the platform. And then the other thing we did um, when we did this exercise early last year, we wrote down a bunch of quotes that we wanted or hoped developers would say about the platform when we were done and when we showed it to them. And so uh, we mocked up this, this little fake Twitter client based on the CMIC uh, client we showed today with some examples of what we, if we're successful, we hoped developers would say. And my challenge is to you is to look at these and come back to us after you've learned about it, you've written a bunch of apps, and play with it and tell us how close to the mark we were. Is getting started cheap and easy? We, we, we tried to make it so that it was. Um, are, are the technologies that we brought to bear, the APIs, the surface area, is it designed? Does it feel like someone actually designed it? And is it cohesive? We hope you say it, it is. Um, we hope you say that the target that you get to go after is highly standardized and that you know that your, your efforts will be leveraged across all the users that, that have the phones. Um, we hope that as you use the tools, and I hope you guys are paying attention to me and not actually doing it right now, but as you're doing that type code, F, F, hit F5, watch your code run, go back in and type more code cycle, that it's quick and fast. And for example, the Windows Phone emulator, um, the initial start of it in the CTP you have, you know, it takes uh, you know, maybe uh, 15, 20 seconds to start because it's actually booting a version of the OS. But once it's running, we have a goal of making it so that when you hit F5, those changes immediately happen um, in a debugging session within that emulator. Um, so we hope, hope we've been successful there. And then, um, and this again goes to this whole concept that it's about the end user. It's about delighting these customers. And we hope that the tools um, allow you to be successful in building beautiful applications, compelling applications and games. Um, one of the announcements you may have noticed this morning is that Microsoft Expression Blend, which is a phenomenal tool for building app um, applications um, that are beautiful, 
um, is now available for doing Windows Phone development, and it's, it's going to be free. It's going to be free. Um, and, we, and we think that, 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 that all these things add up to, to uh, you know, a pretty cool story, and frankly, I'm really eager to hear your feedback. So now, let's talk about the structure of the application platform and the way we think about it. Um, and as we go through the rest of the talks and the sessions, and over the next couple months that we talk about it, this is the structure you know, I think we'll be using to, um, to make our points. There's really four components, and we separate them by, you know, the ones on the bottom are those that run on the cloud, and the ones that above either run on the developer workstation or on the phone. So moving from left to right, the, the runtime is the runtime on the device. It's, the, it's all about the code you write that runs on the, on the device or the screen. Um, the tools and support are the tools that you generally run on your workstation, and that's the Windows Phone developer tools. The developer portal services are the tools that you use. It's basically a website that you go to and interact with that allows you to ship and sell your software. It's how you get your software into the marketplace. And then there's the cloud services that you take advantage of, um, where you either write code in the cloud or you call upon services we provide. And this is a, a further drill into that same picture. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through each of these four um, and give you a survey of each of them so you have a pretty good idea of what these different pieces mean. <clears throat> and we'll start with the cloud. Um, when we think about the cloud services and, and, and what we hear from developers, uh, so I think you'll agree, is that uh, there's three ways to thinking about cloud services as part of applications. The first is the applications that are, or the cloud services that are yours. You're building an application, you write some code on the server, you expose it as a web service. It's your web API that you've exposed. That's the first way. Microsoft has a bunch of stuff that makes it easy for you to do that. We have, we have all the tools in Visual Studio that makes it easy to build web services. We have the Windows Azure service. But at the end of the day, it's Web 2.0 stuff, and it's all standards-based the way it's exposed. You should be able to be, do, be free to do what you want. Um, we hope that you use our tools to make it easier. Um, the next way you think about uh, cloud services is about services that are theirs. These are third-party services that other people build and you build on top of. A great example of this is the Twitter API. Right? Scott showed off this morning building a Twitter app. Um, he was using their web API to do that. And so we know that as you build applications, you think about those. And we've tried to make it easy for you to be able to do that within your applications, both on the client and on the server using technologies like Windows Communication Foundation, um, you know, the ability to do call RESTful and SOAP APIs. Um, Link plays a big part of that as well um, in the platform. And then the last uh, um, set of services are the ones that we say are their ours. And these are the web services that we build into the app platform intrinsically. And as you use an API, sometimes on the server, sometimes on the client, you don't really even know you're using a cloud service. It's just int intrinsically plumbed up for you. And in this release of, of Windows Phone, we have four of those. We have the, the, the set of services around the push notification system. And when I got up on the stage earlier today in my green sounder shirt, I was all nervous and everything, um, I talked about push notifications. The second web service that, um, that we expose implicitly is the location service. And we'll, you'll be able to hear more about that in, in the follow-on sessions as well. Uh, location allows you, as a developer, um, to call a simple API on the client and know you're going to very quickly get um, a location information back. And that information is augmented both by GPS, by Wi-Fi triangulation, and um, the assisted GPS. The third uh, service we provide as part of the platform is the uh, ability to uh, do Xbox Live Gaming. And so within uh, Xbox Live Games on the phone, you'll be able to have access to gamer tag, high scores, leaderboards, achievements, as well as uh, the avatar. Um, that, so that's another service that's explicitly exposed to you. And then the last one is the app deployment system. And this is where you as a developer, and the way that you deploy your apps, um, into the system is a service-based application deployment system, and they reach end users' phones through this, uh, this deployment system. So 
that kind of is a quick survey of, of the cloud services. Um, there's a huge amount of detail in the other sessions. Um, they'll take you into, into each of those and show you real coding examples and so forth. Um, so I, I encourage you to follow up on that. Um, so now we're going to shift and we're going to the other side of the application equation, which is the code that runs on the device. And one of the things I want you to notice about this diagram is that at the bottom of it, we list three explicit screens. We list the phone, the Xbox 360, and the PC. And what we're saying, what the message we're getting across here is that as a developer, the same set of tools you use, the same general runtime that you use is available across all three of these screens so that you can have a strategy as you want to target them of write my code generally once and then very easily target it and optimize it for each of those screens to create the best possible end user experience that's specific to that screen. And so while today, you know, we don't actually support Silverlight on Xbox 360, and that style of programming isn't available, we are stating our intent that over time we will. And all of this will come together in a cohesive way. What we're doing with Windows Phone 7 series is we're, it's the first ship vehicle for this runtime that allows developers to do this. So we'll drill into that a little bit more. Um, there are two flavors of applications that you can write that run on Windows Phone 7 series. You can either write a Silverlight fl flavored application or an XNA flavored application. And what we heard from developers is that, um, uh, particularly from, from developers that, that are you know, more on the, the extreme ends of the application spectrum, is they want to be able to have um, a, a focus tool for the job. And so we think that most applications, things that users will reason as being an app, as, a, as something other than a game, will be written using Silverlight. Um, and what we've done with the application platform is made sure that the, the common things you want to do as a developer, things like act, dealing with media and so forth, are available from both. But there are two flavors you have to deal or think about as a, as a developer. The right mental model is that when you fire up the tools and you're kind of scratching your head pondering what, what you're going to build, you have a decision to make. You're either going to choose Silverlight or XNA, and then you're going to go through that door, and for the life of your app, you're going to be on that path. Um, and over time, we have a, a bunch of ambition about removing those differences as, even more than we already have. Um, but for this release, that, that, that difference does exist. Um, and so if you're building an application, you want to have the metro style UI, you want to take advantage of the, the rich controls we provide, you want to be able to use XAML markup, you're going to use Silverlight. If you're building a game, and that game is highly inter user interactive, um, because it's a, you know, more of a Twitch style core game, um, or it uses 3D, you're going to use XNA. And so that's really the decision matrix. If it's a game, generally you're going to use XNA. If it's an app, generally you use Silverlight. There's absolutely going to be crossover between the two. Um, we've already seen a bunch of really fun games built using the Silverlight flavor, and we've seen some interesting apps built using the XNA flavor, although there's less of those because it's, it's, it's not as obvious that you would do that. Um, is that, so I think that makes sense, um, and we've heard from developers that it works pretty well. So the things that are common between these two, and what we've tried to do is make as much common as possible, um, are, are the, fo the following things. First, the way you deal with input within your app um, is the same. The, all the phones support four-point uh, multi-touch, um, and the APIs for dealing with touch input are the same across both flavors of applications. Um, that way you access the hardware buttons is obviously the same as well. Um, we've consolidated both the, the, the ability to do digital media input and playback back so that you can have, you know, listen to the microphone, for example, from either, it's the same API, um, or you can play sound back um, from either and it's the same API, um, same is true with video. And then access to the media library on the phone is available from both. Um, from a data perspective, the Windows Phone application model provides you with isolated storage as your storage system. So when your app runs, you have a little mini file system that is yours. It's basically the same API that shipped in, uh, in Silverlight before for isolated storage. Um, and the, the only actual file system like access you have when your application is running in that sandbox is your isolated storage. If you want to access other data on the phone, we have specific high level APIs for that. For example, we have the API for accessing the, the media library. Um, we support link 
um, in the programming model. If you don't know what Link is, you should go find out because it's pretty freaking cool. Um, it stands for uh, Language Integrated Query, and it's a great model for integrating database access directly into the, uh, the programming language. The .NET runtime that uh, we support on the phone, we get this question all the time, which version is it? People want to know which version of it is. And my pat answer, which doesn't always go over so well, which is it really doesn't matter and it shouldn't matter. What we've done is we've created a, a runtime that is a superset of, of Silverlight 3. It is, um, has some pieces of Silverlight 4 thrown in. And if you want to you know, understand what the differences are between things you've done in the past, just think, OK, if it's Silverlight 3, I'm good to go. And there's a couple other things that it has above that. So what this means is that whether it's the compact framework or the, dot, the, the full .NET framework from big windows, it, it really doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, we've done a bunch of work to make sure that all the layers we put above are independent of that, because over time, we'd like to get some of the advantages of, um, of the, the, the core CLR onto the phone and take some of the advantages that the, that the compact framework has um, um, into bigger windows. For example, it's optimized for these ARM processors and, um, and, 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 and battery usage. Um, so, uh, WCF is there as a, as a key feature underneath both. And then access to all the phone-specific uh, functionality, whether that's the, the user interface model for the, the back stack model navigation uh, system that, that, that the Metro design language defines, um, you know, how your apps get paused and so forth um, is, is common across both. Access to the sensors, the accelerometer, uh, the, uh, the, the camera, and all that stuff is common to both. Um, and then we have this concept of pickers. So uh, if you wanted to uh, present to the user um, a list of users from the contacts list so they could pick a, a contact and then you get that contact, contact information back in your app, we have APIs for that. We have pickers for photos and contacts and so forth. And then um, there's the cloud services that I already mentioned, and those are available for both, both styles of applications. One point that's really important that people kind of miss here is that if you want to build an Xbox Live enabled game, you don't have to use XNA. That service is available to either flavor of application. So the application model. Um, when it, all platforms have an application model. They have some system that's designed that gives structure to how applications execute you know, on, the, on the fabric of the device. Um, and so we have one, obviously, for this, this, this platform. And the way we think about that app platform uh, app model is, again, to start with the, the, the user first principle. How do we ensure the best end user experience uh, for applications? And what we really mean by that is how do we ensure an end user experience where it's always predictable? No matter what app I run, when I run it, how long it's been since I've run it, it always runs the same way. And I know that um, that, that, that predictability and, and, and deterministic behavior is there. So that's the first thing. End users expect that. The next thing that, that they expect and we really want to ensure is safety of the application model. End users, in order for them to buy a lot of applications and acquire a lot of applications, need, it needs to be very friction free and they need to feel safe doing it. They need to know that no matter what app I get or game I get, it's not going to screw the rest of my phone up, it's not going to corrupt other apps, and it's not going to kill my battery life or use all my network. And so the app model has to take that into account. And then the, the third factor is high performance. Um, in order to, to, to satisfy end users, the application model has to support apps that are snappy and quick. And um, so that's another aspect. And then the, the last one, and this one really highlights this idea of there being a tension between these. Because um, we really want to enable lots and lots of innovation. We want developers building for this platform to do things we haven't even imagined. And if you create a sandbox that's too tight, that, you know, that, that ensures super predictable behavior, in, ensures super safe um, operation, um, and it's high performance, you may not enable all innovation. And so we've had to balance this, and uh, we've made some decisions in this release that are optimized around ensuring that end user experience. Um, but we still think that we, we've enabled um, um, all of these things in a really great balance. So really the first part of this is this, this concept of a sandbox. Applications on the phone run in a managed sandbox. 
That man, that man sandbox is defined first and foremost by the fact that it is an entirely managed code runtime. All of your code is managed code running within the .NET um, framework on the CLR. Um, the next part of it is the process model. And so this is how we use the, the operating system primitives underneath. It's the Windows CE-based operating system. Um, we've abstracted away the, the, um, uh, you know, some levels of that. But there's a bunch of operating system primitives that are used that allow us to secure the sandbox from operating system access. So for example, this is how we make sure that, that uh, if your app um, doesn't say it's going to use location information and hasn't warned the user it's using location information, it can't access location information. Um, it is also how we reclaim resources back um, um, from applications that, that are no longer running and so forth. Um, and then the third leg of the stool for the application model is the service-based application deployment system. And so applications, in order to get on the phone, except in developer scenarios, go through our service to the marketplace onto the phone. And what this allows us to do is do some really innovative things in both the process model and the sandbox of the CLR. An example of this is when you ingest your application into the uh, into the application deployment system, we crack the application open and we inspect the, the IL code of your application in an automated way. And we make sure you're not doing things that will break it out of the sandbox. For example, we do some additional type checking that normally the CLR would do on the device. And because we do that, we're able to actually improve the performance of the CLR on the device. And so these are some of the things we've done in this release to really optimize these um, end user experiences. Over time, we will tweak this, we'll add to it and augment it. Um, we felt it was very important in this release to, um, to make sure we nailed um, this model. So it may have become apparent, maybe not. Those of you who've been playing with the tools have probably figured this out. But the unit of execution for a Windows Phone application is a zap file. A zap file, XAP, um, is really just a zip file, renamed. And it's the same format that's already used by Silverlight. And, and this zap file format is used for both Silverlight and XNA flavored um, applications on the phone. Um, uh, and it, it includes all the, uh, the manifest information and so forth needed by the system to install and deploy your app. There's no scripting or anything like that um, required. So now I'm going to talk about tools. And um, the biggest thing here is I think we've talked about, the, you've heard the announcements about the tools, but the, the key thing that we want to enable is so that as a developer you have one download, you don't have to go and download six or seven different things, install them in the right order, make sure you didn't um, forget anything. It's all one download. That's our goal. Um, and uh, the other thing we want to do is make sure is that all the tools you need to build real Windows Phone applications are free. Um, the uh, CTP of this is available today. You can go to developer.windowsphone.com, download them, and start getting going right away. One caveat on this is that we were unable to get the new version of Expression Blend into this download package for the CTP. CTP. So it actually is a separate download um, you know, at this point in time. But the next time we do a turn of the crank, it'll be integrated into that download as well. So let's talk a little bit about the, the process of getting an app from the tools um, and, and doing your development on them. I've already shown, and Scott showed, a bunch of examples of deploying to the emulator. Emulator is an x86 virtualized environment. It's actually the Windows Phone 7 series OS compiled for x86 running in a virtualized environment on your workstation. Um, we did that virtualization and we took the strategy because it gives us great performance. If we were to try and emulate ARM you know, on your one gigahertz laptop, um, trying to emulate a, you know, a, a modern ARM processor, you're going to not get anywhere near the performance you want. But with this, we basically get one-to-one -one performance. It is 3D accelerated, so all of the, the, the DirectX stack, or I'm sorry, Direct3D stack that's on the phone flows right through the emulator, and it also supports Windows 7 multi-touch. Um, in the emulator. So we've already shown that, so I'm not going to demo that. What I am going to do is a quick demo of, um, of deploying an app to, um, sorry about that, to a real device. Make sure the device is actually on. And what I've done here 
is I've got a really dorky app I wrote, which is a flashlight app. You know, if you really wanted to make it simple, you literally just changed the background from black to white. I did a little bit more and had some graphics in it. Um, so what I've done here in the tools is I've said I want to deploy to the actual device. And so I'll hit F5, and then I'll switch to D, and hopefully this is actually on. D. And so cross your fingers. I can no longer see the Visual Studio tools. Oh, now I can. It's deploying. And there we go. And it's just a dorky little flashlight app. But I did enough to actually make it have a nice, pretty background of a flashlight and so forth. It's 10 lines of code, 15 lines of code for that app. Uh, the point was really just to be able to show off the, the, that you can target de devices directly. The way this works is you take your, your standard Windows phone that you, someday you'll get, um, and <laughs> you, you, uh, you plug it into the, into the development, in, or actually you don't even plug it in. You take your Windows phone tool, your, your Windows phone, and you go to the uh, deploy, the, the web portal, you register as a developer, and you enter the, the ID of your phone. And via the uh, web service, we developer unlock your phone. And from that point on, your phone now can work with the developer tools. Um, and we have a bunch of detail of that in the tools talk. You'll learn more about how the mechanics of that actually work. But it's a, it's a pretty cool system we think is very friction free. So then you, you have a bunch of we have tools that are going to be part of the future releases. They're actually not in the CTP because you can't actually um, ingest your tools into the deployment system yet. Um, that's not yet enabled. Um, and that's where we segue into the portal services. I'm getting low on time, so I'm going to kind of get through the rest of this. Um, I should be OK. Um, so with the deployment process, um, you take your app, you build it, you debug and test it. We also have a, a beta test program. So as you're, um, you're building your app, you have the ability to work with a set of your customers or testers to make sure you can have hundreds of phones you can target your app at during kind of beta testing. And again, in the tools talk, we'll talk about that. Um, you submit your applications. They are then certified. We have an entire talk talking about the certification process and the policies that we're driving there. One thing I want to say about our certification process is we have you know, two overriding goals. One is to make it as friction free for you as possible. It is not our intent to make this some sort of onerous thing that causes you a lot of pain. Um, but the other thing that, that drives it is we want to make sure the end user experience on the phone is great. Um, and so we balance those two things out. And, we, and um, you'll have to let us know how we're doing. Um, we do have a principle we apply, which is this process will be very transparent. And it is our intention to make sure you know what is going on during the entire process of your application being certified. Um, and then and, and, and there are no surprises at the end. Um, once the application's been certified, it's in the marketplace, and offers are made to the phones via the marketplace, and that's where I get to do a quick segue into the marketplace. Uh, the marketplace is an experience, an integrated experience on the phone. We don't think about it as just another app. On most other smartphone platforms, including the previous versions of Windows Mobile, the marketplace is just an app you run, and you use it to download apps. What we've done with Windows Phone 7 series is we've created an integrated experience for acquiring content, music, videos, podcasts, applications. And the ability to acquire those things permeates throughout the device. A, a perfect example of that is in the Xbox Live gaming hub on the phone is a place where you can acquire games. The, the marketplace is exposed through that. A, a friend could recommend a game to you. You get a notification, you go into the Gamer Hub, and that's where you initiate um, the, the acquisition from. And we'll be talking more and more about this over time, getting, uh, giving you more details. Um, the whole idea is to make it so that it's fun and easy for users to acquire applications. The belief is if we make it fun, easy, and safe, they'll do it a lot. And if they do it a lot, you're going to be happy campers as developers. Um, so uh, a couple aspects of that that we've enabled, we've enabled try versus buy. Uh, and so any application in a game can be try versus buy. It's a really simple model. Cool. <laughs> um, the model we've implemented is very simple. 
Um, there's, there's primarily one API. It literally is called isTrial. And it returns true or false. And in your app or game, you call that. If it returns false, you're not in trial mode. So you're just going to expose everything. If it returns true, well, then you need to restrict your app or game in some way. And it's up to you to decide how you do that. You either say, oh, user, you can only play levels one, two, three. Or you can say, you can only use this app 10 times. Or you can say, oh, you can only use the app for 30 days, or whatever you decide. Um, but we, there's another API that complements that, which is the API that allows you to um, take the user directly into the marketplace experience so they can buy the real version of your app once they're, they've gotten done with the trial period. And you can surface that UI in your app. Um, the APIs for that are not uh, in the CTP today. Those will be coming later. Um, payment flexibility. Um, the marketplace supports both mobile operator and credit card billing. The idea is to create a friction-free uh, experience for the end user. We've found that uh, mobile operator-based billing, where the charge shows up on the, the cell phone bill, um, can cause four or five times the, num the amount of uh, uh, commerce. Uh, that other systems provide. But in, we also support the credit card billing. And this is all managed by Microsoft. The user only has to enter their credit card once, and they don't have to um, deal with a lot of complications there. And updates are also managed through this system. So your applications uh, can, will be updated via the marketplace as well. And, and there's a deep dive uh, that talks about that. This is my further imploring you to stay in this room or leave for a little bit and come back for the session that follows mine uh, for the, the Windows Phone design team. Um, and this is a call to action to you as well. We have invested a great amount in creating what we think is a beautiful phone experience, a phone experience that is going to delight in users. And, and I know as I use the phone um, and I dog food the phone, I'm constantly just like, oh, this feels so great. And it, it's, it's fresh, and it's fun, and engaging. And um, we, we hope we've provided the tools that will allow you to build equivalently great experiences. This talk and, the, and the, the design guidelines that we're publishing are all tools that should help you um, uh, do the same thing. And I'm pretty excited about that. So the final call to action, god, I nailed the time. Perfect. Final call to action. Um, uh, for this talk. First, go download the tools if you haven't already done it. Um, it's uh, random sampling. How many of you think it took more than 15 minutes to do? How many think it took more than five minutes? How many think it took more than a minute? So it's somewhere between five and 15 minutes it takes to download and install this tool set. All right? Um, it's fully featured. There's, a, there's probably bugs. Like, it's a CTP. Like, it's, it's not completely out of the oven yet. Um, but it's very rich. And all of the applications you saw in the keynote were built using these tools. Um, and, and so you know, the, the power is absolutely there. Um, and, but we know there's room for feedback. So make sure you give it to us. Um, there's a lot of different forums for you to do that. You can, you can definitely just send me email. Um, we also have the, the forums off of developer.windowsphone.com. You can post uh, feedback and questions there. Um, and you can follow us on progress. You can follow me on Twitter. Um, you can follow the w WP7 uh, dev team on Twitter. And we also have several blogs. And with that, um, Recap of the next couple of sessions. This is good. Um, this is when they first created this slide. It was really ugly. And this is the first time I've seen it. So, um, the the first session is the is the one that follows this in this room, the design session. Um, tomorrow morning, if you haven't done Silverlight development at all, it's new. What we've done is created a session early in the morning so you can get a primer on Silverlight. Um, we recognize there's a lot of people who came to this conference for the first time um, and maybe aren't aware of it, so, so we put that in there. Following that are, are the two sessions that really get to the core of the application platform. Um, if you're doing XNA development, you really should go to these as well, because this is where we talk about a bunch of the, the infrastructure underneath that's common across both, like notifications and the location API. Um, so you, both of these are really generally required sessions if you want to do Windows Phone development.
Then tomorrow afternoon, we have a session on optimizing performance. As we've built a bunch of apps and worked with the partners um, to build apps so far, we've learned a bunch about how to make sure you can build really, really performant um, apps and games. So we have some good tips and, and prescriptive guidance um, at that session. And then on Wednesday, we have a whole another set of, oh, there's one more on Tuesday, which is uh, how to use debugging around, primarily around um, um, XNA games um, at Tuesday. Um, afternoon. The early morning on Wednesday is the application platform architecture talk. And this is really going to be a, 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 you know, a fun talk about the, the innards of the platform. You'll be able to understand how we built various aspects of it. Um, you'll get insight into, into, into how the application model actually works, how isolated storage actually works, um, how we plumb up the services and so forth. Um, it's presented by uh, my colleague Istvan Sasiri and uh, um, it's going to be a great talk. And then uh, the, all the marketplace stuff, the information about how you'll work with the marketplace, how you'll make money on your phone apps follows that. Uh, the um, session at 1.30 on Wednesday is, uh, again, optimized around uh, building high-performance games using um, the XNA framework. And then uh, the final talk is uh, an app for developers who are building websites that they want to make work well with Windows Phone. Um, and this applies both to the browser on Windows Phone, but also that browser control that is now hostable within Silverlight flavored applications. So that's it. Now we can do Q&A. And the microphones are lined up there. Please use the mics. Let me go to the front here. Hi. You talked about um, certification. Will there be any content control from, um, from the uh, App Store side? So it's a great question. Um, at the talk tomorrow, I'll get all the details of that, or, or more details than I have time to talk to that. We do have three types of tests that we do. We have business-related uh, policies, we have technical-related policies, and we have uh, some content-based policies. Um, and we'll talk about the details of those uh, at the session tomorrow. In the back, or in the middle, I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, the phone is great, by the way. but. I'm wondering what have you done in regards to battery life? It looks like it's moving a lot and getting information from the cloud pretty often. So have you done something in regards to that? So that's a great question. We, we invested heavily in ensuring battery life is great. As you probably all know, with these modern smartphone platforms, there's a real challenge of, of having really small devices and having good battery life and, and then having these great experiences. Uh, we've done a bunch of things there specifically. Um, all of the UI you see on the phone um, is accelerated uh, through Direct3D to the GPU on the phone. And we've done that in a way that is highly efficient of battery use. Um, it really keeps the CPU out of a lot of, the, out of those great UIs. That's one thing we've done. Um, the push notification system that we've built, and I talked about earlier, and you get more details on tomorrow, uh, is also, a, 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 you know, it, it really is about preserving battery life. It's a single pipe. It's highly efficient from the phone to our services that we manage that, it, that allows applications to be alive for the end user, but using very minimal resources. So those are two examples. Thank you. You bet. And in the back. Is there a mic back there? OK, I'm sorry. I, my vision isn't all that great. In the front. So uh, you showed a demo of deploying the application through the cloud. Does the developer have any control in that situation? For example, things like demand loading of zaps, which is becoming a popular pattern in Silverlight. So I think you, you, you said I showed a demo of deploying to a, the cloud, you, I deployed to a about, device. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, for this release of Windows Phone, um, applications, the zap packages that come down are self-contained. We don't support down, uh, demand loading of, of those applications in this release. I have a deployment question as well. You talked about deploying using the development environment, and then you talked about deployment through the App Store. What if I'm building an app for my 100-person company? What are the, are there, is it in, there an in-between option where I don't have to stick my corporate app in the App Store to get it to all my employees? That's a great question. Uh, we 
um, in this release, we focused on the consumer scenario of, of consumers buying, buying apps. And for that reason, in this release, we do not support the deployment scenario that you talked about. So in order to, to support that, you'd have to, do, you'd have to do something in between yourself. Okay. Any future plans? Uh, we, we absolutely, uh, it's something that we want to do over time. In this release, we had to focus on getting this right. And so it's something in this release we're not doing. Got it. Thanks. You bet. Yeah. Are you doing anything uh, with regards to subscription billing? Um, are we doing anything with regards to subscription billing for app purchases? Yes. In this release, we're not. Uh, we're not. At least we're not. No. In this release, we're not doing anything around subscription billing. It's something we hear a lot of demand for, um, and we want to do in the future. Thank you. Uh, on one of the on one of the slides, you showed uh, Windows, Windows Phone, and Xbox at yeah. the bottom, and at the top, you showed Silverlight and XNA. So, does that mean at one point there'll be a, the ability to deploy your Silverlight games on the Xbox? And then, aside from that, does the emulator emulate the performance of the device, or could something run better on the emulator than it will on the hardware? Okay, so two two very different questions. On the first question, um, we're not actually announcing anything around Silverlight on the Xbox at this point in time, but we are stating our intention to create a, a developer environment for developers and a platform developers that allow them to share their code across these screens over time. We, we definitely want to get in that direction, and we're moving there, but we're actually not announcing anything specific today. On your second question, um, there are differences between the emulated environment and physical devices. And there always will be. And you're going to want to, for a lot of applications, you're really going to want to have a real device before you actually uh, ship your, your app or game. For a lot of, a lot of uh, apps and games, though, actually, the emulator is going to be pretty darn good. So um, it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. My guess, you know, we still have a bit of time to learn stuff. My guess is that most of the time, you're going to want to have a real device. Yeah. Uh, what's the process if our company wants to become a strategic partner with Microsoft? Um, you can send mail to me. Okay. And I'll just forward it on to someone else. <laughs> See Kindle at Microsoft.com. Okay. You bet. Yeah. Uh, I get the impression that SQL Compact would not be supported on devices for Phone 7. Is that true? That's a, that's a good question. These are, these are the, I've been waiting for these. Um, <laughs> So actually, uh, we actually do use uh, SQL Compact as part of the integrated experiences under the phone. Unfortunately, in this release, we weren't able to get exposing that up uh, to the, to the third-party app platform. Um, it's something we absolutely are working on um, and will deliver over time. But in this release, that's not available. Victor Larson from Avanade, again. Again. <laughs> will I be able to offer an app for free in the App Store? Uh, will you be able to offer apps for free in the App Store? Absolutely. Great. Um, quick question. Automatic updates, uh, will they prompt the user, or can we just send them on? Automatic updates for, for uh, oh, I see. applications. Yeah, in, 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 in this release, the way that the, the application updates works is um, when there's a new update, the user has to take explicit action to install the update. Um, we'd like to hear from developers and users on what the model really should be. We focused on getting that right in this release. Thank you. You bet. Uh, the phone looks great. It looks like you're uh, targeting more consumers, not business people. I'm, gl the, I'm glad you noticed that. What, what, are, the, <laughs> what are the plans for 6.5 and business users? Yeah. Are you going to continue for a while? Yeah, the, the, the existing uh, Windows Mobile business with 6.5, with we are going to continue to support that uh, for some time. We haven't announced any sort of end of life for that. And we absolutely know there's demand for that. Um, and we'll and, continue to support that. And, and enhancements or just? Yeah, we're not announcing anything along those lines. And, and really, our focus is on uh, you know, Windows Phone 7 series. Um, and, and we think that the platform that, that exists there for a lot of the scenarios where it's being used is really good. So yeah. Yep, I love the shirt. Thank you, sir. I tried getting the cool graphic equalizer one, but they were sold out. <laughs> ah, bummer. Uh, when, when you're saying this release, are you talking about the one from here at Mix? Oh, good question. That's, yeah. No, I'm talking <laughs> about the release of Windows Phone 7 series that will be available for holiday 2010. When I say this release, that's what I mean. The, 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 the limitations that I've talked about today are, will be true for the release um, that we release for holiday 2010. Okay. So, in that sense, then, um, or in that light, what's the data engine going to be for local data storage if you're not yeah. going to have 
SQL yeah. Compact, and obviously we can't use SQLite because of P invokes and all that other fun yeah. stuff. What, what's the data storage? So we have, um, you have access to isolated storage, and you clearly can do XML you know, files on your, on your, in your, in your, your isolated storage, and you can build your own data engine on top of that. Um, unfortunately, in this release, we're unable to, to do a really great job with that, um, and so it's something we're going to do later. Wait, so since we can't do something, well, is there some solution with Azure integration? Where there's we a, could there's a huge, SQL uh, yeah, I mean, with, with all the WCF support and, uh, and, um, Linked to the XML, you can build great solutions to take advantage of backend databases. So we yeah. will have access to the SQL Server Azure on the, the backend. Cloud? Oh, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah. So on on the six five three thing, I know. I, sorry, I had two questions that I thought of while I was there. Uh, on six five three, so if you're if you're doing embedded or line of business applications, should we kind of stay away from Windows Phone seven series and just kind of. Because, I mean, really, none of this really applies for the business apps that we're writing. So is this strictly consumer, you know, you can have games and Our, our cool focus things, for but... Windows Phone 7 series is, is for phones that are purchased by consumers. Um, it is, it is, it, we, the expectation is consumers buy these phones um, and they use them for both personal and business. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is our focus. Okay. And, and last question, I swear. Uh, Visual Studio 2008, is that the, and I know you're probably not going to answer this, uh, is that the final uh, release that's going to include any Windows Mobile 6.5x development tools? And um, the, the tools that are available for Windows Mobile 6.5 are the tools that are available now. We will continue to support those. We don't have any plans to do any sort of enhancements or changes to those over time. We always are listening to developer feedback, though. Okay, thanks. In the back. Hi. Is there any API for accessibility or options in the phone for accessibility for blind people or yeah. low vision? It's a great question. Um, it's one of the details that we're, we're not talking about at the conference yet. Um, we'd love to have an offline conversation to talk more about it. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Do you guys plan to enable the Windows Mobile application for other OS by way of either like compiling for a target platform or perhaps to have emulators of uh, Windows 7 OS in a target uh, operation system? We're focused on shipping Windows Phone 7 series and making it successful um, and allowing, uh, allowing developers to build apps for Windows Phone 7 series. Um, we're not talking about any, any other phone operating systems or anything like that. Yeah, I meant to develop on Windows 7 application, but enable it to run on other phones? Um, like I said, we're focused on, on, on the phone we're building, enabling developers to build, phone, build apps for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, we see that there is a tight sensor integration in the Windows phones, and my question would be, is there any plan to extend the sensor framework and to add new sensor cap capabilities? Yeah. In, in this release, and um, uh, we have a set of sensors that we define as part of the hardware um, specification, um, and those are what we plumbed up and built integrated experiences over. Over time, we know there will be more sensors. Our general technical strategy in that direction is uh, to encourage the use of IP-based protocols to talk to other sensors, and that's how we'll plumb things up. But in this release, we're focused on the sensors that are defined by the hardware we've talked about. Okay, thanks. You bet. Uh, application interactions. Uh, first of all, is it possible uh, uh, for one application to launch another to get data back? Uh, uh, and the second, is it possible to share persistent data between applications? Um, so the first question is, is it possible for me to you know, have such an IPC between applications running on the phone? Um, and, and you know, share data between them. Um, for the integrated exper experiences we have and the, uh, the things like pickers and so forth, we do have the ability to exchange information. In this release, that's not exposed to third parties to be able to create those. Um, that's something we hope to do later. Um, the second question um, around, uh, what was your second question again, remind me? Uh, sharing uh, persistent, uh, persistent data. Uh, yeah, so um, 
the isolate storage model we provide in this release really restricts you to share, to having the persistent data that you have is isolated to your sandbox and your sandbox alone. If you want to share information between application and persistent 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 way, we recommend that you use a cloud service to do that. Thanks. You bet. Okay, he stole my question, so I'll move on to the next one. Um, <laughs> do app, will apps be able to run in the background in any form, even you know, as a service or anything like yeah. that, where they can be queried as a just as a provider or you know, just for the push notifications and or for right. other things? So I've been waiting for that question. Um, in, this, in this release, third-party applications, the ones you build, will always be paused when the user nav navigates away from them. And, um, and this, the process model will likely you know, kill that application if it needs to reclaim resources. The, the net effect of that is that in this release, you cannot write code that runs in the background. That said, We've done a bunch of work to make sure that most of the experiences that end users care about have multitasking-like capabilities. So let me talk a little bit about that. The first thing we've done is we built into the integrated experiences on the phone um, the, the most common background types of tasks that, that, that users care about. So for example, music playback. Users want to be able to you know, listen to music while they're doing other things. We've built a service that you as developers have access to. You can start music playing from your apps, and that music will continue to play even after your app is, is paused. Um, we have services that allow phone calls to continue in the background while, while apps are, are, are started and stopped and so forth. So that's the first part of it. The second part of it is uh, through the live tiles on the start screen and the notification system, we can, um, without your code running, update your live tiles with notifications. So for example, the Major League Soccer app I showed this morning, the live tile of that a user reasonably would expect any time they pulled their phone out of their pocket and looked at it, they would see the most recent score. And the way the system works is your MLS app just pushes a push notification with the latest score down, and then we handle, uh, in the background, getting that information and updating the tile for the user. What this allows us to do is control the overall end user experience, maintaining battery life, which is really the most important factor here. Network utilization has a big part of it as well, but really it's battery life. Um, and we've made these decisions um, really in, for this release, and I'm, I, I keep saying that, um, because we want to make sure we get it right. It's so important that when end users get these phones, they have a delightful experience that's consistent. I tell a story about um, my daughter, who I bought a competitor's phone for a while back. And um, three days after, after uh, she had the phone, she came to me and said, Dad, we have to take it back. And I said, why? And she said, well, the battery lasts three hours. And, I, and she was just flabbergasted, I so was I. So I looked at it, and it was a social networking app that she had downloaded and installed. It was just a simple social networking app. But it had, the developer decided to put some background code in it that ran in the background, and it just sucked the battery dry. Now, you could argue that's a, a bug in that app, right? And I certainly considered it. But from her experience, it was a crappy phone. And so um, in this release, we've constrained it. We just, we, do, we want to enable all these experiences to happen, but you can't do them all at once. You have to pick which ones you nail, and we've decided to nail them in this kind of constrained way now, and we have the ability to open it up over time. So that's the whole background application story. And, and you learn more about how notifications work tomorrow, and it's actually pretty damn cool. It's one of, the, one of my favorite features, um, particularly the, the way it's so easy to integrate on the back end. In the back back there? Um, so as a part of the tool set that is being released, uh, is there a plan to release a scrubber tool that would r remove all the older installations of Visual Studio that I have on my machine? Because in past, it's been a pain to get everything to coexist. Are you talking about on the phone or the dev tools? The, the dev tools. Yeah, you know, I think we've really upped our game there. I, I think that you'll find that we've done, a, we've done a really good job of now allowing side-by-side -side and a coexistence of different versions of the tools. On my personal workstation, I have Visual Studio 2008, I have the RC uh, Visual Studio 2010 Ultimate, and the Windows Phone development tools, and um, you know, I'm uninstalling and reinstalling different builds all the time. And so I, give us feedback as you're using the beta and so forth, um, but I think we've upped our game there. Thank you. So. Uh, Howdy. So um, how about installing a SIP uh, other than the, the Microsoft provided one, either through the marketplace or by the OEMs? Yeah, the, um, there's a bunch of 
pieces of the phone that, where we provide built-in user experience. Um, and that are, they're part of this kind of authentic Windows Phone experience. Um, and the SIP is one of those. It's one of those things that, that, um, that, that we feel we're, we, you know, we want to make sure we create a great experience on. So the SIP is not replaceable by third parties. Think the OEMs would be cool with that? Um, we have great relationships with our device manufacturers and our mobile operator partners. We're, I mean, we're making great progress with them. So, All right. thanks. I'm yeah. Jerem. Uh, Windows Phone 7 Series was my idea. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I, I, maybe we could do a television commercial about that. <laughs> How will uh, multiplayer games work? Is there support for ad hoc uh, networking, TCP? I mean, how does that work out? Our focus for this release is on um, enabling the Xbox Live integration. And it's more about turn-based multiplayer games. Um, and we, we really, you know, frankly, don't have a lot of support in the platform you know, for, for really rich ad hoc multiplayer at this time. Okay. It's something we want to do over time. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Quick question. Uh, it looks like you guys have a great uh, emulated environment. Uh, do you know if developer uh, devices are going to be available for purchase at some point? Uh, you know, emulators are great, but they do oh, make yeah. me a little bit nervous. Yeah. Um, absolutely. We will make developer devices available to developers early in the process. And we haven't announced any of our plans around that. But um, yeah, we, we absolutely know we have to do that. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Are uh, front-facing cameras going to be part of the hardware spec, or is that something you just, uh, as the lock goes? Um, the, the current hardware specification does not require a front-facing front camera. Um, we, uh, um, I don't recall if we prevent them or not. I'll have to follow up on that. Um, it's allowed? Thank you. So it is allowed. So, so a, a, a device manufacturer could have one. OK. And you keep speaking about the neck. This drop. When's the next version? Next drop. Well, so yeah. Um, so we are we are focused right now very much on on you know getting these bits over the finish line for phones that ship for holiday 2010. Um, and we've done a huge amount of work re-engineering our engineering system so we can be far more nimble than we have been in the past. Um, and the fact that we were able to do all of this and get to the point where we are in the short amount of time we did is, is testament to that. I mean, we have a relatively fast cycle planned. Um, and we've, we've got a lot of stuff we know we, you know, we want to do next. So we'll be really quick on that. But we're not, we're not in a position to announce um, when that will be. Thanks. Yep. Then I'm going to do one more after your question. Oh, cool. Um, do you have any documentation or tools for porting existing compact framework applications over to Windows Phone 7? Um, I don't know if we've actually developed any of those. I, I suspect there'll be a fair amount of, of activity in the community helping people do that. Um, what we've heard mostly from developers who've been Windows Mobile developers in the past is that um, they're actually really excited about getting a, a fresh start because the tools are so great and the capability is so great. But a lot of that core like runtime code um, should port over really straightforward. It really, it should, it, we, most of the services are there. Okay. Okay, and last question in the back. Okay, uh, is there a theme map API and what, what is the functionality it contains? Uh, can we uh, access the uh, location and my location and uh, uh, the cell tower uh, information? In the, um, uh, within the Windows Phone development platform, you have full access to uh, rich web service APIs including, if you are a member of the Bing developer program, including access to the, the, the Bing APIs. There's no reason why you can't make use of those. Um, we, in the CTP, we're not providing um, the, the Bing map control, um, um, but it is, is going to be available built for developers to be able to build mapping apps using um, the Bing service. OK? Uh, OK, thanks. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs>